and how. Is it okay if I record you? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. And so how lucidity is really just the first step to stabilizing that opening, right? Yes. For the amygdala so that then we can access those healing points. And like I said, that it's always the connection. So what are you connecting with? Yeah. And somehow it's a that... really big story, but it's all Kundalini. And it's what Tufan had on his slide last week to the cosmic Kundalini of the 1987A, the supernova. Uh huh. Yeah. Wait, and what you said about, you know, if you can make a still point, which is where we say compression happens, then that connection through that center, which is longitudinal, that's the distribution. Then that's the, the DNA radio hooked up. And that's uh, the experience. You know, uh, Mauricio uh, used his Therify for the uh, Lucid Dreamers uh, group, luciddreamteam.com meditation. And it was amazing. It was almost, it was so powerful. It just, it's amazing that plasma and people looking at it, they get in phase and ring like a bell and amazing. Yes, in phase. That's why it's really so intriguing to do the global um, therapy meditations when we all sync up. Yeah, it, and it really requires someone to steer the tornado. <laughs> yeah, and and what else does the tornado does the tornado want to say or impart? You know, it's a two. That's right. The, the tornado has a message, and you know, in Deep yeah. Space Nine, when they went down the the the, the wormhole uh, stargate between worlds, they discovered that the wormhole stargate has intent and you needed to have a good relationship with the wormhole otherwise yeah <laughs> big tornado yeah. steering so stargates indirectly the the wormhole between stargates is mindful look out <laughs> yeah uh, shelly i'm sorry i couldn't recall the link that i shared could it be someone else about 19 1987 no, it... no, I saw it on your slides last week, unless I'm having like a Mandela effect or something. I saw it on your slides last week and we didn't oh. talk about it. It was Supernova 1987A and that's part of the cosmic Kundalini point, right? The firing of the pineal gland. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go back and check it yeah. as well. It's yeah. sorry. <laughs> the Kundalini firing is a still point. Yes, yes. Well, yeah. this is a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Shelley. So hello, everybody. Uh, as you know, I'm Dan Winter, FractalU.com, FractalField.com. And here speaking was Shelley Evans from TheShareableWave.com, who's also quite skilled in remote healing and many things and an expert therapist. And we have Tufan Guven with us from GeometricModels.org. <laughs> and Tufan is here. And we have an announcement. The new book is coming out. Wait, I need to show you something here. So, so you see, we when we finally realized that the serious breakthrough physics here was actually, is this going to work? Uh, yes, cover of the new book. Look at that. So uh, the new book is entitled Planck Fire, Perfected Charge Collapse, Cause of Gravity, Consciousness, Life Force, and Neg Entropy. We realized that the explicit U word that the physics community was using to describe cause of gravity was charge collapse. And the sp same words, charge collapse, is used by most or many of the scientists trying to describe the cause of consciousness. Hello. <laughs> and the only thing they appeared not to know was they agreed it's charge collapse, but it's the question of the cause of charge collapse that they ain't figured out yet. <laughs> And so the new book is really focused on, you know, communicating with people who have a care for serious sciences, how dramatic it is to understand that all these phenomena, once you know the cause of charge collapse, you can describe where consciousness and gravity come from with such detail and all kinds of things that are negentropic, neg like the origin of rainbows. So the new book is going to be fun and we're stuffing it with pictures and Tufan has been here for over a week already, and he's the chief editor and writer of the introduction. <laughs> so look out, the new book is coming, guys, and it's going to be serious fun. And it's really intended to rattle the science community, scientific community, because you can't ignore if somebody finally told you why an object falls to the ground and showed you how, and how consciousness forms inside your head, vortex in a vortex. So we think we have some serious contribution to make and can really you know, uh, make a serious statement in the scientific community with lots of literature and publications. Anyway, so this is cool. The new book is probably 
be out in a matter of weeks, guys. So, and you can see it, the, actually the preview, at Planck Fire, P-L-A-N-C-K, Fire, P-H-I-R-E, PlankFire.com. <laughs> There's already a teaser there with the color cover. Ain't that fun? <laughs> so we had a good week here and the creativity, creative juices are flowing and it's all good. Anywho, so FractalU.com, today's conversation, the theme and subject of today's conversation is the practical hygiene, and we say hygiene for bliss, and this applies to all aspects of life, diet, environment, kinesthetic movement, and the psychology in major categories. And even saying it is for bliss is uh, too simplistic. It is, in fact, it is the diet and hygiene and practice of simply how to get a big aura. Because if you have a big aura, that means you're immune, you have an immune system. That means you're probably going to be able to lucid dream. That means you're probably going to be able to steer tornadoes. It means you're probably going to take memory through death and all the cool stuff. It means you have a soul. So very simply put, this is the practice of getting a big aura. That's what this is. As in when Francis of Assisi wandered down to the woods and Sister Claire came down to join him and they prayed together. And in the village, they all called the fire department because <laughs> their aura got so big. Hello. How did their aura get so big? So the hygiene for getting a big aura, that is the essential subject for tonight. And again, the essential principle of what makes your aura large, a very simple question. And there's a very simple way to meditate on that answer, which is roses cannot unpack unless first they're well packed. It's really quite simple. So if you don't get the compression going, and this directly applies to how bliss works in your DNA. So I have another little share screen ready. It's our, you've seen these pictures before, but so if you look down the tunnel of the double helix ratchet and, and you see how this, this is a short wave now, this is basically ultraviolet. This way. And now the braid on the braid of the braid in the braid is being driven by a set of phonon coherences, which are up above. This is, this is the EKG power spectrum, which HeartMath learned to do for me, uh, where you measure the onset of coherence in the EKG. And then that cascade of harmonics on the right here is where Glenn Ryan, at my suggestion, measured the difference before and after you expose DNA to heart coherence. So that is the coherent phonon of your heart saying, I love somebody. <laughs> and so that cascade of phonons is like a set of fingertips, a set of tensors that grabs a hold of that helix, harmonic embedding, perfect nesting. The short wave embeds on the longer wave in phase if those harmonics are coherent. And we have this fun little the braid within the braid of the braid on the braid, the braid. And so if you look down the throat of that implosive braiding, it looks like this. So this is what we're thinking about. This is our central metaphor. Is there something doing compression that the braid of DNA is getting tight? And when the braid of DNA gets tight, it's, 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 literally, it's literally imploding. And the DNA then actually turns inside out and makes a torus donut. You all know that story. So when the DNA braid gets tight. The transverse component of the electromagnetics in that wave, which are going like this, are focused down an implosive cone caduceus and out the, squeezed out the center only if there is compression is the coherent longitudinal interferometry, the wave that's going like this, compressional wave, sometimes called scalar, correct term longitudinal EMF. So that perfect squeeze in the DNA, spits out coherent longitudinal. The same kind of squeeze in the spine liquid pump when you're feeling Kundalini. Same exact set of harmonics. The cascade is longer there, longer wave. But so the spine liquid pump is doing the same thing. And the heart is doing the same thing, squeezing perfectly. And then the golden ratio in the brain waves, flameandmind.com, is also imploding and squeezing. So the result of that nest of perfected squeezings which are net implosive, is that the compression enables the body to radiate coherently 
this longitudinal array. The very, I think one of the first times this was actually noticed on this planet was when all these uh, anthropologists were wandering around Australia and they'd see these Aboriginal uh, shaman they would be sitting there and you'd think they were sleeping. And then you ask them what they're doing. They say, oh, well, uh, 20 miles down on this here song line over here, there's a water vein that needed to be moved. I was moving it. Well, how are you moving it? It looked like you were sleeping. No, no, no. I was, uh, it, they were in effect lucid dreaming. They actually had leverage on a water vein. In the same way, if you ask a good dowser, the, 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 unskilled dowser moves water veins with a hammer, but a skilled dowser moves water veins by talking to them. And how do they get coherent enough to do that? Their aura gets coherent. So that kind of coherent aura, longitudinal interferometry, that is effectively the primary goal of having a life. You know, when you walk into Sears and Roebuck and they say, get a life, <laughs> what do they mean? <laughs> no, to get a life is to get an aura that is, can, have an outreach. That's what it means to get a life. So it's also what, what it means when you say, can you raise a kid to have a soul? That is a skill that's being rapidly lost on this planet. And we have announced clearly in no uncertain terms, and that viral went, that video went viral, that viral went video. <laughs> and the physics of what is a soul is that coherence in the aura. So making that happen in the aura around your body, that is a clear and stated goal, not just of how to have bliss, how to have hygiene, how to have an immune system, how to lucid dream, how to take memory through death, how to douse. It's all about that skill of your aura getting big and coherent. That's a very specific goal. And so when we say hygiene for bliss, we mean more than just bliss. We mean the ability to cohere your aura. So now that, to say, what is the definition of hygiene success? That's it, a big aura. By the way, not subjective, lots of ways to measure GDV. You know, now it's called BioWell with Karatkov. is one among many ways to measure the coherence of your aura. It will predict whether you can lucid dream and if holes in your aura will predict hygiene problems, health problems, very clearly. If your aura is big and symmetric, that's good. And if it ain't big and symmetric and got big holes in it, that's bad. As we say, when your kid is doing recreational drugs and you would like to suggest some hygiene, it's not subjective. Tell them, get a measurement made and you'll see the holes in the aura. The reason recreational drugs put holes in the aura is because the centripetal force gets asymmetric. In other words, oh yes, you can have a wonderful set of visions in your LSD trip, but ultimately one part of your body got more implosive than another. And then eventually you get massive asymmetry in the centripetal force in your body and you get big holes in the aura. My former partner, Gamadi, she ran a meditation school and she said, what do, I said, what do most people come there for? She says, well, most of the people come here have been doing drugs too many years and they realize, <laughs> you know, that their aura is as porous as a sieve. And that is a major attractor for astral parasites. As anyone with clairvoyance can tell you as soon as they walk into any bar where they're serving lots of alcohol, what do you see? All kinds of plasma parasites. Why are they there? Because there's holes in everybody's aura. Then uh, would this also go for digesting hormones or gold powder? Well, interesting. So um, the gold powder is pure atomic implosion and very powerful. Uh, the purely chemically derived uh, gold powder with David Hudson, we had some, eventually we realized it was really quite dangerous. You, you, you actually having it in your aura could burn a hole in your aura. Uh, and it, it, it's very understandable because it wasn't biologically contextual. So, uh, you know, the way the ancients would make uh, Ormes, the spice, which was called Holy Communion at that time. And by the way, Akhenaten... Moses was a gold powder cook. Uh, they had relatively organic sources and then they would bake it and the sulfur would emerge. They had a certain shaggy algae that made the quasi nano gold edible. So the, the algae 
it was called a shaggy algae that would uh, render the gold powder uh, almost edible. And and then you had to bake it. And they, it was baked like a cake, actually. And uh, it's Chaz at Priestess Alchemy. He's very good at this. Um, so th they would bake it, and then they had these little gold powder cakes. And this is a wound white wafer. It was called Holy Communion. Well, uh, in, the short answer to the question is the relatively organic sources at which Chaz is quite skilled. Uh, for example, the difference between purely chemically derived ormus versus what's called agricultural ormies, where they start with deep seawater, which is high in rhodium, iridium emulate anyway, and then they put this massive caustic alkaline, and it will precipitate out in a milky, literally it's milking the ocean, <laughs> and this milky uh, well, uh, trace mineral, which is high in rhodium, rhodium amulet, basically phase conjugate materials, will precipitate out in this milk is fabulous for agriculture. That's an example of an organic source. Another is the what's called Manatech Manilo, uh, which is aloe derived. So there's a lot, it's a complicated story. But in summary, we're all looking for implosion in our food. <laughs> you know, the Chinese, they would eat a little gold foil on their cake. <laughs> it was edible almost. Uh, so everybody's looking for implosion in their food. It's sort of like looking for a heart of gold and growing old. But ultimately, you know, what you're looking for is food that's naturally implosive. And and let's since we're that's one of the categories of hygiene for bliss we're going to discuss anyway. Let's discuss an example of that difference. The difference between the corn that you can buy in any store today, which has been even if it's not GMO, which it probably is, but it's certainly been monocultured for you know many decades. And that DNA, after decades of monoculture, is like a child whose father's 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 father has been in jail for 20 generations. I'll tell you, that kid's going to be angry. And that DNA in that corn that you can buy in your grocery store is about as angry as it can get. And yet, the opposite of that, and I was there, uh, thanks to Susan Ambrose, actually, who knew uh, Grandfather Dan and all the Hopi. Uh, you know, she had some of the Hopi blue corn meal. And I watched quite a few times, and that corn meal would call the wind. And that corn meal would only germinate when you sang the right song. And it was a family pet for 100 generations, just like the magnetic line across Australia is a family pet for many generations. So that was DNA that was psychoactive. And when we ate these, they call heirloom seeds, vegetables, extreme genetic diversity at my farm in Western New York, same story, I've told it many times, that those plants in that heirloom seeds, extreme genetic diverse garden next to the labyrinth, my friends decided they didn't need LSD anymore because you ate the, that garden food and you had visions. <laughs> so that is the difference between happy DNA and unhappy DNA. So the joke was, you know, Every time you pick which veggie to eat, you whisper to it, when was the last time you experienced genetic diversity? Which is another way of saying, when was the last time your DNA was happy? <laughs> so that's why it's, you know, when you say I need to grow my own veggies, it's more than about, you know, just eliminating the, the pesticides and the GMO. It's also about, are those veggies happy? Well, see, a vegetable that grows in the presence of genetic diversity actually is ensouling. It, 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 important to recognize that genetic diversity is more than about, oh, is this DNA different enough from that DNA? That's part of the story. The rest of the story is that genetic diversity produces an implosion field collectively, which is more than the sum of its parts, you know, if you, when you go into the right forest with extreme genetic diversity, it's inherently blissful just to be there because your DNA is in the middle of the most rich DNA radio ever. So that's why if you lose the genetic diversity in your garden, you know, the DNA ain't happy. And eventually the charge collapse don't happen. And when charge collapse don't happen, your aura doesn't radiate. So again, uh, we're going to divide now this conversation about hygiene for bliss into four major categories. We know the definition. The definition of success is 
is your aura getting bigger? It is very simple and it's very measurable. And which could be called hygiene for bliss or hygiene for a bit big aura or hygiene for immune system. It's the same meaning. And, and those four categories are going to be diet, environment, and the kinesthetic, the movement, and then the psychology of how do you think only shareable thoughts, I'm sorry, shareablewave.com in, in honor of Shelly here. <laughs> no, but it's about if you can think only pure principle continuously, like every day, you're having all these experiences. Now, if each time you have an experience, you distill that experience into, is there a pure principle which can survive, serve the survival of everyone in that experience and distill that experience to that pure principle? and focus on that only, <laughs> every time you get to pure principle, you have what's called eureka, and your hair stands up. The reason your hair stands up is because you've imploded capacitively. It's called eureka. But actually, you've discovered the pure principle of that moment, and that you can distribute to all of DNA everywhere, called the shareablewave.com in honor of Shelley. <laughs> and so that enabling of charge distribution is the psychology, meaning essentially that if if you spend most of every day being angry at somebody, your charge, your aura is just plain going to collapse because that ain't shareable. And if you die angry, it's a seriously bad news situation because that's not compressible. So it's the compressibility of the shareable thinking, which distills the point that all of your mentation is about pure principle only. That's an introduction to the psychology of bliss. So we've touched on the, the, the diet for bliss and the psychology of bliss to be continued. But uh, too fun, were there any fun questions that? Yeah, yeah. Um, here's one question from Ajda. She says, Dan, my teen daughter is on eight week resonance science course with Nassim Haramein. We mentioned, your, we mentioned your name there a lot, but Nassim never claims to know what consciousness is. Wouldn't be your definition logical to accept in the large scientific community? Well, it's true that actually, you know, Nassim did some good work in showing the golden ratio in the uh, cascade from Planck to the scale of the universe. Uh, he didn't extend that to a specific definition of the cause of gravity yet, but we have, and we've extended that to a cause of consciousness. In the same way, uh, we have done the brainwave work to be able to describe very accurately what the cause of consciousness is, which is charge implosion. And it's true. I would say, you know, our YouTube channel just went from 2 million to 3 million and things are cooking and our audience is growing very rapidly. So I'm pleased about that. At the same time, you're right. The general scientific community is not with us yet, but I think we have the kind of momentum where we're going to get there now. And I'm very enthused about the new book, Planck Fire, which is specifically designed to address that question because we think it is undeniable when you see that you take Planck multiplied by exponents of golden ratio and you get every wavelength that produces neg entropy from hydrogen to galaxies and DNA and photosynthesis. So ain't nobody can say that isn't important that Planck times golden ratio equals neg entropy. And that's absolutely new. It's absolutely inter incontrovertible. It's we are absolutely the original publisher of that. So I'm very optimistic that at some point very soon, that you know the big scientific community will no longer be able to ignore us. In the meantime, our audience is growing rapidly and our science is becoming more compelling and our technologies are taking off rapidly. So we are gaining momentum and I'm happy about it. Anywho, uh, was there another question? By the way, we had so much fun with Nassim. We sponsored uh, him at our Budapest twice. Well, we had Budapest International Concerts on Physics uh, multiple times and we sponsored Nassim there a couple times and Valerie was you know having fun with French with him and then uh, we were with him in Paris you know it's it's a colorful and you know we were very close to Elizabeth Rauscher who was his major consultant for all of that and that was an extremely colorful story and we won't go there now she claimed she did the math and you know there's all these controversies and really that's boring but the core principle is here is we think we are able to describe electrically, very precisely, more accurately than anyone has in history, the cause of consciousness and the cause of gravity. And that's a simple, clear statement with simple, clear physics and see plasma, plasma fire, I'm sorry, plonkfire.com and you will see all the answers very soon.
Okay. Any other questions at the moment? That's all for the time being. Okay. So we were talking about the hygiene for bliss. We touched on a little bit of the diet story and a little bit of the psychology. You know, can you think in terms of only pure principle? The more you think about pure principle, the more you will implode and attract charge and radiate charge and get a big aura. But let's just finish something in terms of the dietary section. So now do you understand why DNA that has not experienced diversity becomes angry, which is what we were talking about, and what that means, how that feels. So when you eat angry DNA, for example, you know, that corn that has been monocultured for, you know, 50 years, uh, what you experience is mucus. And the mucus you experience when you eat monocultured, particularly grains, uh, the mucus is your immune system saying, it feels the pain. It's literally saying not self. And so it has to make mucus to make a barrier. It's the same way an autistic child after pain builds armoring. So your armoring is your mucus. Another example is, you know, it's been claimed now that like something like 90% of wheat addiction to, uh, what's in the wheat? Uh, uh, not glucose. Uh, Gluten. gluten, thank you. Gluten. And the, the wheat addiction, uh, wheat um, allergy to gluten, 90% of that is actually glyphosate. And the analysts are very clear. This has been studied. So the, the fact that there's trace glyphosate in almost all the wheat and grains now, uh, and there's that produces a huge, huge allergic reaction. So this, these are some of the reasons why you really need to know where your food came from, actually. And this is all obvious, and you've all thought about that. And the genetic diversity, it's an old story. The other thing about uh, the diet, of course, is the oil. Uh, even, in fact, it's said now that most vegetable oils are actually not natural and not digestible, even aside from the fact that th those that are synthetically produced and oils that are produced with, with uh, petroleum distillates are fatal so probably 90 or more percent of the oils in your grocery store are literally going to kill you see the film lorenzo's oil about what it did to the myelin sheath so the oils are a very tricky thing um you know the raw olive oil of course is quite good and there's a few but it's very tricky and i think um a little bit of the sesame oil when you need so very great attention to oils uh what else should we say in the basics the uh, ability to um, eat high quality protein without suffering mucus is getting more and more tricky. You know, for example, that the shaman would have a lucid dream and identify which fish he was going to catch the next day before he would be willing to eat it because he knew that that fish would be willing to share its memory. And if, so if you didn't get permission to share the memory of the animal you were eating, the, the shaman knew that this was going to cause massive fractionation. So what that means in practice is that most meat means you're, of course, eating the pain of the trauma of the death of that animal, but it also means that you're then going to think and feel like that animal. And if you've ever been in a French restaurant where the French people are eating huge amounts of pork and half of them look like a pig. And I'm not saying that pigs are quite attractive in some ways, but they're thinking. I mean, it's, you can just tell. In fact, you, if you eat the protein of pork, it's so similar to human proteins that your body does not reassemble it. It just sticks it right in there. So, of course, you end up looking, thinking, and feeling like a pig. And I don't mean to insult the pigs here. I think they're some of the most intelligent around. But the Aboriginal knew that you do not eat your relatives. And the pig is your relative. So for God's sake, <laughs> and that's just the beginning. Uh, by the way, the Aboriginal knew that if you did eat your relatives, then you were more likely be, to be eaten by a shark because it has to do with the smell, guys. And that's another story. So, the, you know, obviously vegetarianism makes a lot of sense with a lot of attention to getting high quality protein. And you know all that story about lentils and beans, et cetera. Where do you get the high, the sprouted ones, for example? high quality grains and proteins. This is this is all an old story. We don't need to do this here. But the point is, so step A is recognize the critical nature of diet. 
This means that you need to learn how to cleanse, as Valerie is saying every day, and you need to learn how to fast occasionally, and you need to know how to keep a high metabolism. In fact, I think we'll take do that section next, which is the kinesthetics of bliss hygiene. The kin Before going there, would you like to take a couple of questions? Sure. sure. Yep. All right. Um, so can you elaborate on how LSD creates holes in the aura? Well, LSD is reducing the threshold of the synaptic gap spark ignition. <laughs> so in other words, your synaptic gaps are likely to fire more densely. And that means that you will get more lightning inside your head which means you can make inner pictures easier. And in fact, inside your head will then form a hologram easier of what's outside your head. So, you know, when you're on LSD, you can more easily actually see the longitudinal interferometry of your environment. You'll probably see the ghosts and all kinds of cool stuff. So you'll have a great show. Minor little detail is that your your aura, your brain waves, the firing density in the synaptic cortex having been raised, uh, you have attracted more charge there and that will create implosion in that one part of your brain for a short time, which will then uh, decrease the ability of your aura to be symmetric. So you can think of it in, as, in crude terms as one part of your aura is going to get a hole in it because that part of the aura has imploded too fast and cannot restabilize in symmetry. Another way to think about it is ultimately what keeps your aura symmetric is you holding one attention at center. And if your attention is divided in a hundred directions, you're very fractionated in your attentions, so is your aura going to be very fractionated. But to be able to hold one pointedness in your attention, this is not going to do well after drugs. And it's very clear. Anyone who's ever done too much marijuana as a kid knows for sure. Oh, yes, you can think fast, but oh, no, can you hold one thought? Absolutely not. So if you can't hold one thought, that means ultimately your aura is not going to remain symmetric because you can't implode symmetrically to one point. So literally you lose one pointedness. That's a very simple way to describe the problem of drug addictions, basically. Anyway, next question. Um, Terry asks, how much does one's energetic practice help? For instance, I have always assumed that the reason why LSD weakens one's aura is because you chemically boost yourself into insights that you have not energetically or spiritually prepared for. And then you can't regain those same insights again without LSD or sometimes even with it. Well, that's a very useful way of thinking about it as well. I think that basically, yes, you had your LSD trip and you saw all this cool stuff. <laughs> and then you came back and you can't remember it all. You can't digest it all. You haven't sorted it all out. And so you're a little bit more scattered and your attention span is a little scattered. Now, actually, those who do, for example, ayahuasca or Ib was it iboga, uh, you know, doing iboga, to eliminate addiction is very interesting. People get a short-term implosion experience and they see a bigger picture. And those kind of experiences for people who are having serious problems and they need to have a peak experience in order to sort out their world, one shamanically guided uh, you know, psychoactive experience might be very relevant. I'm sure there's very good shaman out there that can help with that. Uh, so basically, people need a peak experience in order to sort their lives. It's very simple. That's why, as Freddie Silva usefully says, the lost art of resurrection is to be able to teach people how to have a three-day near-death experience. And one of the reasons I'm here to talk to you today is that my father was a saint, and he had a three-day near-death experience when he was a teenager, a car accident. And when he came back, oh yeah. 
So that's why they thought the Voynich manuscript was just instructions on how to use herbs to kill yourself, but it wasn't. No, it's how the Templars are teaching people to properly construct a necessary near-death experience so that you can be initiated. So people need, and now that's, let's see, it doesn't mean that people need near death. No, it means that people need a still point in which, from which everything can be sorted. Now, sometimes lightning can do that very well, ask Daniel Brinkley. In my case, it was Kundalini. So in any case, if you can inhabit that center, that still point and that lightning bolt for a little while, suddenly everything is sorted. That's why young people are so desperate for sex, because they need any kind of climax experience in which to sort their aura, simply put implosion. Now, if they're lucky enough to have a little meditation discipline, they can get there organically. There's less danger of messing them, messing their life up. Basically, I, 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 I'm, excuse me. <laughs> why do the kids need sex, drugs, and rock and roll? <laughs> they need the still point. <laughs> is rock and roll a still point? No, but they need the climax. And the climax is the still point. And that's from which implosion sorts your life. Okay, next question. Next question from Janet. Is not the purest form of bliss accepting everything and everyone exactly for what it is? Is it allowed and created and beneficial to the collective unified consciousness field, accepting the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then creating the new? Well, I think that's a, that's a useful and appropriate language, but I would just comment it, it. Remember, what I'm suggesting is not let go and let God. No, I I suggest that's far too passive. What I'm suggesting is, okay, you're right. Whatever's coming at you, you have to accept it. It's like the Tai Chi of every blow that comes to you, you deflect it in such a way that it adds spin to your aura. Well, that's good. However, it means you really need a sense of the big picture so you can steer enough of your decisions toward bliss hygiene. And you may you probably need to take a very active, intentional role in deciding you are going to follow your bliss and you are going to do the discipline it needs to have a big aura and make decisions. Oh, my aura isn't big enough because my clothes are bad or my aura isn't big enough because I have a rotten diet or because I am thinking negative all the time or so because I'm living in electrosmog. So you get clear on what's limiting the growth of your aura and take serious, positive, direct action to fix it. So that's that's not entirely passive either. But still, I mean, I, it is a true if you need to accept what's coming at you, but at the same time, you, it is the strength of your will that's steering that tornado ultimately. Next question. Next, Next one. one. Can, can you give some examples of shareable thoughts that we can practice yeah. daily? Yeah, it's like whatever puzzles in the universe really fascinate you, whatever it is. In my case, cause of gravity, cause of consciousness. Any puzzle, any mystery, that it just intuitively that you feel that mystery is rich, whatever it is, then you really focus deeply upon that and burn through it until you get to the core, pure principle. Why do objects fall to the ground? They need to know what causes consciousness to form inside your brain. You need to know it's a plasma tornado. So whatever, any mystery at all, whatever the mystery is, if you focus on it and your intuition is telling you from all your past lives, which of your interests actually go somewhere? Is there any pure principle in it? For example, probably studying human tax law is not going to help getting a soul too much. Although you might earn some money. I don't know. It could be. But ultimately, or, you know, or learning football. For There are some things you can just guess probably are not going to serve the soul very well. And after you had your near-death experience, you might sort your priorities a little bit. So, you know, thinking about pure principle. Or another way of thinking, you're driving, you're, you're, you're having tea at a coffee shop and you see an argument between two lovers and you're at a distance but then you begin to sense deeply what was at the root the deep deep root of that argument and you then you 
embed yourself and you feel deeply both sides of the argument. And this is why they say Shakespeare was about alchemy, because if you consume the perspective, you see from one perspective and then the other, the cue box, the Shakespeare theater. And then at the end, you feel everyone as if they're oneness, you feel their intentions from both sides. And then you feel, you feel the pain of all parties involved deeply. You deeply feel the pain of both sides, the war so well that you can, you can, you can steer that tornado from within. That's how they say the shaman steers the tornado. The shaman steered the tornado because once he felt what the pain of the tornado was, and the pain of the tornado is whatever is causing its charge to bleed. So that when the tornado passes over a metal building, its charge bleeds. So the tornado experiences a metal city as pain, quite literally. Pain is only defined by fractality that's bleeding compression and therefore bleeding charge. It's the only definition of pain. So if you could feel that deeply enough, suddenly the tornado falls in love with you and follows you around like puppy. That's the old story. So feeling the pain so deeply of all the parties in a conflict that's an example of pure principle. And then you feel where the pain came from. It could be 10 generations ago. But by feeling it so deeply, the empathy grows. That's why the more bliss you have, not only does your DNA braid and you can feel dousing lines at a distance. And by the way, I'm getting kind of good at that. The other day, we were walking up the hill and this lady has a very dry farm. And the farm is big. I couldn't douse the whole farm, but I just asked and I felt it like a 180 and I could feel the direction where the magnetic cross is. Where can we make rain here? So I became better at feeling magnetism at a distance as a result you know, of decades of Kundalini and bliss. So that's what happens. And then all those magnetic lines are happy to talk to you. So that's an example of feeling the pure principle in situation. You're so relaxed. You're so conductive that everything has a voice. Any other Any questions? questions? Uh, uh, regarding the pure principle, is it possible that the Eureka, Eureka moment can happen where something seems to be true and the pure principle in the moment, but then later turns out false? Well, chances are, if your hair stood up, <laughs> your biology benefited from the implosion. <laughs> but it, it's true that, you know, first you think you got to the pure principle, and then you realize you got a hundred more layers to go. Still, you're on the path. And that's <laughs> it, when you realize that the issue of digesting a lifetime of memory in such a way that it will go through death. And you then realize that what determines that is literally compressibility, why you see your whole life in a flash at the moment of death, Heinrich Kluve form constants. So the principle was compressibility. And once you discover that and feel very deeply what compressibility is, then you know why anger is not compressible, does not implode well. It's not a shareable wave because at the center of compression is perfected distribution. And anger, if you happen to know the Centex waveform is one over seven, it's actually destructive wave interference. <laughs> you don't compress at all. <laughs> it means simply that you haven't experienced deeply enough the inner mindset set of the person who you think hurt you. In other words, if you understood so well why this guy is hammering a nail into Jesus. <laughs> what, why was that Roman hammering a nail into Jesus? I think Jesus actually knew <laughs> and forgave him. So th this, this is the process of such deep empathy. And so that after that, there was no anger. Ooh. That means you could die well, even the next day. Anywho. All right. So Maybe we should move on with the, is that okay? Sure, but there's one more about the pure principle. Maybe just, just let's cover, cover that as well. Is this okay? Sure. sure. How, How does one take and transmute specifically evaluation of perceived negative aura into pure principles and positive understanding both sides of the argument? Are we not here to feel the pain and help and transform and transmute the energy of even those that can't see? Therefore, inhibiting the purest form of principle, the real shareable way. It's true. So there are some people 
whose pain and anger you recognize that you are the right person to be helping them. And, and that's a real category and very appropriate. As your intuition gets sharper, you begin to realize that actually the number of people that you can seriously directly help could be quite limited for many very practical reasons. So your intuition gets much better at picking out those for whom your help will make the highest leverage distant difference. In other words, you get very efficient at finding out where you can help that will make the biggest difference and make a long-term difference. And you recognize, hey, you know, X number of billion people on this planet, and maybe there's three that I can really help right now, whatever it is, you know, maybe this video reached 10,000 people, cool. But the number of people that I can really help when I answer the phone, how can I help you, you know? <laughs> Your intuition very quickly tells you who, for whom you can really make a difference in an efficient way. And the really efficient way of helping others is when you realize that helping that person, you're healing yourself also. And if it's not going both ways, it probably isn't actually useful or efficient. So you don't kid yourself into thinking that you can help everyone. And so you see all these angry people around you and you're highly focused. You're going about your business. You know what your soul can do to be. Essentially, it's this. You know what is your highest level of service. Very practical. So when famous, uh, who was the Australian lady who was teaching people to live without food? And one of the things that, you know, well, you need to spend certain amount of time in nature, and then you won't need food. And then they said, oh, you need to be convinced for yourself that you spent enough of the time of your day doing whatever it is that you consider to be your highest level of service, whatever that is. So if you spend enough of your day doing whatever it is that you deep inside believe is your highest level of service, then you implode well. And by the way, then you don't need food. <laughs> and so it, it's that, that is the switch that enables you to absorb charge is when you are convinced that you are doing what is your highest level of service. So obviously, yes, you're surrounded by angry people and you have no problem water off a duck's back. They can all do their karma and you wish them well from a distance and you go do what is your highest level of service. And that then is your way of discriminating for, you know, there's auras around you that have lots of messes in them, but that doesn't mean that all of that is your problem. No, your problem is doing what you consider to be your highest level of service because your intuition is telling you exactly where your path to bliss is if you relax and listen enough. Well, do we have fun? Okay. We did. Okay. Okay. Some more questions for later. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, well, just to say the major categories of hygiene for bliss. We talked about diet only a little bit, not fresh. And by the way, the whole conversation about hygiene for bliss is the central subject of my second book, uh, Ecstasy, Immor Ecstasy, Implosion, Secret Science of Ecstasy and Immortality, PDF at goldenmean.info slash conscious kids. So the whole book is hygiene for bliss, these conversations. So we did a little bit about diet. We did a little bit about the psychology of how you think thoughts that enable your aura to grow. Now let's do environment. Oh no, or should we do kinesthetic? Maybe we do kinesthetic first. So the kinesthetic goes like this. There are certain movements which will inherently implode charge. And if that movement is a jerk, I mean, if you're a jerk, it will do the opposite of imploding charge. <laughs> it's called the quality of grace. So, you know, you could even do this. With, if you did this where the rate at which you make a spiral slows down gradually. So you reach the still point. Now, if you did that right, let's do it again. I'm making a spiral from the long end. Here's the center now. Slow down there. Now, if I reached the center of that spiral having deaccelerated contiguously correctly. Then when I reached the end of that spiral, the tip of my finger started to tingle. Now, the reason the tip of my finger started to tingle at that moment was implosive capacitance. 
That's called the quality of grace. And if you make a jerk motion, your tip of your finger loses charge. So that difference, literally implosive capacitance, is the phys physics of the quality of grace. So Sister Mary Nunn said, approach the communion rail with the quality of grace. What did she mean electrically? <laughs> it meant that you move in this way like a Sufi dance where the quality of attention inhabits your every movement. And this is the way you move all day, every day. It means probably there are no jerky movements. It means probably there is a certain symmetry in the spiral geometry of grace, whether it's Tai Chi or Eurythmy or the sacred gymnastics or, uh, you know, Carlos Castaneda's uh, tensegrity movements. We taught all of those years ago. But it's a simple physics that recognizing there is a geometry of movement which will be capacitively implosive. Another category of that is, for example, the physics of mudra, that if you hold your fingers like this, the segments here, one, two, three, four, five, no, one, two, three, four, five, the segments are more pent. So when you hold your fingers like this, the microwave, and I do mean microwave, and the sign diphosphate, will be more pent and implosive. And you will feel a tendency to accelerate metabolism in your hand. Now, if you were to do the opposite like this, which is much more hex, the microwave will uh, destructively interfere, stabilize, just like a hex will, a snowflake. And, and therefore you will feel a slight slowing down of metabolic rate. Now, that's just the beginning of a hint of the clue of the physics of mudra, that basically the microwave radiance, which is, you know, it's the ATP, ATP, that's how you measure kundalini in the microwave. It's fun stuff. So the physics of mudra is another introduction to the physics of the kinesthetics of bliss, that essentially you're always radiating this high frequency stuff. Are you doing it implosively? And this is an introduction then that, you know, they, they say, you have Baraka, look at me and I will redeem you. <laughs> what does the guru mean? <laughs> what he meant was, if you focus on the leader and he has Baraka, which is the quality of grace in movement, etc., then he will be able to radiate to you as a seed that implosive capacitance. Another way of saying Kundalini and bliss is electrically contagious. Very clear. When I first had Kundalini, people around me were getting headaches all the time. I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized I had a blasted fast metabolic rate and it is contagious. You know, I was there when they were drinking Muktananda's bath water. Why? <laughs> you know, the, the water absorbed the biophysics of Kundalini. It was a microwave. I mean, there's a lot of physics there. So, or another example would be when uh, Ray Moody documented with medical surgeons that death visions are electrically contagious. So when there's a successful death and all the surgeons in the room saw the same thing, he's documented this. Why is the death vision contagious? It's because it's a black hole that's working if it was a successful death. So this is all an introduction to the why the aura can do a kinesthetic of bliss. And then Moving on, that you see the Gurdjieff sacred gymnastic, for example, forming twos. We were just talking about it. Remember, uh, Tufan was reminding me the forming twos was like you could do frequency X with one arm and frequency X over two with the other arm. And then you were doing frequency X over four with your leg and X over eight with your other leg. You were holding eight harmonics in your attention at the same time. And by the way, if you can do that, the bandwidth of your attention increases. That's an example of kinesthetics of bliss. The other thing Tufa and I were just discussing was Glenn Velez of Paul Winter concert. He could do drum ratio one over two, two over three, da, 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 da. three over five, five over eight, eight over 13, and 13 over 21. Can you, do you know a drummer that can do seven over five over eight, eight over 13 as drum ratios? Well, if you can do that cascade as a drummer, guess what? The climax is pure bliss. Why? The rhythm geometry has imploded. <laughs> and that can be done in time or space. It doesn't matter if the space is or the time is. 
It's implosive. So these are examples of how the kinesthetics of bliss work. They're all about charge implosion. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's say we're, we're not going to do too much more in that category. Again, there's more in that book, Conscious Kids. So the fourth and last category, we did diet. We did kinesthetic, the movements of bliss. We did uh, the psychology of how to hold pure principles as thought to enable bliss. Only think shareable waves. D don't spend your life on anger. You remember the last scene in the movie Ghost? No, the last scene in the movie Flatliners. <laughs> the people that got sucked under after death, were they thinking shareable waves? No. Okay, last category, environment. So let's talk about environment in terms of will your body get bliss only if you're in the right place and time. So the, the, this is what Carlos Castaneda called find your place of power in the room before you sit down. <laughs> what did he mean? He meant locate the place of implosive capacitance. And by the way, in most houses, the place of implosive capacitance in many cases can be identified by the place of echo. The ability of the acoustics to echo is in, often, not always, often indicative of a place where capacitance can echo because the symmetry, depending on the dielectrics of the environment. So the perfect echo is more than metaphor. Perfect echo is more than metaphor for how you get immortal in general. The immortality you take at the moment of death is specifically your ability to make a sustainable echo. That's what immortality is for sure. And obviously, if you're in the wrong place, any Sufi can tell you, you ain't going to get much echo. <laughs> so where can you make the perfect echo? For example, remember we said your aura needs compression. So remember when Karatkov said, by measurement, we can tell where magnetic lines cross, you can get measurable military grade telepathy every time. It's called the cozy rear mirror. First, measure the nanoteslas of where the magnetic lines cross before you ever begin trying to get quality telepathy. The reason was this is called a longitudinal node, literally a compression node. And this identifies whether you're Aboriginal or whether you're Karatkov, the physical scientist, it's the same science, which is a compression point. The reason that is so valuable that magnetic line is the priceless treasure of the Earth's blood. And breaking Earth's magnetic line is literally like cutting her blood. It's tragic. Anybody that puts a highway in and cuts an Earth magnetic line gets bad karma, probably for generations. It ain't good. So until you can make a magnetic map and identify where magnetic nodes cross, you're not going to find your power point. So that's number one is the fundamental skill of basic dousing is something you need to know for yourself. Yeah, okay, hire a geobiologist and a dowser to grid it. Well, it is fun. But ultimately, if you can't hold your hands out, relax, and feel a slight tingle when you walk over a strong magnetic line, if you can't feel that, you're in trouble. Hello. The earth's blood ain't talking to you. You got, you got a problem. So practice, go find a really strong magnetic line, get yourself in a good psyche healthy and practice walking over strong magnetic lines, closed eyes, whatever it takes and learn how to feel a magnetic line for yourself, please. It's like, are you going to feel the blood or not? That's what it is. It's an earth magnetic blood. And the, that's the only way the earth grid's going to talk to you. You don't feel it because then you can pick up the Schumann harmonics and the Schumann harmonics is not just the earth grid radio, but it's DNA radio in general. Schumann harmonics are the brainwave harmonics of bliss. So step number one, learn to feel a magnetic line. Now it's okay to get some help for that and reckon it might take a while. You can use dousing rods if you want, use your hands. There's a hundred ways to learn basic, some basic dousing. Step number two, as we've said a thousand times, Make a magnetic map of your bed and your house and your yard and your city and rearrange all of them to look like a rose and then you're done. <laughs> well, it, it, it just means that 
you know, Prague, as we said, the Prague's magnetic map is literally a rose. And it attracts money and tourists because, and the reason Prague's magnetic map is a rose is because that's a meteoritic caldera. And the meteor was super dielectric, just like the Kaaba stone. And that made a fabulous rose-like magnetic map. So essentially, and now there's a village in Bohemia where the mayor decided he was going to color code all of the town's magnetic lines in the sidewalks. Do you think those kids are going to learn something when they step over each magnetic line and see that it's color-coded in print on the sidewalks? The living blood of Earth's magnetism is visibly mapped on every road and sidewalk in the village? Hello, that's transformative, man. Now the kids know where to go, where to stand, where to find their bliss, where to find their telepathy. So this is the beginning that you locate the compression points in the Earth's magnetic grid. And it's true that the Schumann harmonics will not enter most buildings because most buildings are full of metal and the wrong dielectric. But a healthy building will allow the Schumann harmonic to breathe through the building. High dielectric materials, which are biologic material. And this is Biologic Architecture 101, bioarchitects.net and goldenmean.info slash architecture, the complete curriculum. But it's basically, since we now know which building by measurement will cause a seed to grow in a child, we can accurately advise by measurement which architect should get paid. It's that simple. And that idea is spreading fast, guys. Our bioarchitects group, thanks to Juan Schlosser, they get these multi-million dollar temple contracts in India now. Hello. Even the Indian gurus are recognizing, oh, sacred space is physics. They're putting lotus geometry, dial, biologic materials up, huge temples in India. And they've learned the physics of how to build temples. And it's about nothing other than charge implosion. That's what a temple is. Nothing, no other definition has any meaning, actually, because it's the only way to make bliss and seeds germinate and kids grow. Anywho, so on a practical level, just to finish this uh, subject to environment, though, um, the issue of electrosmog is obviously huge. We really need desperately, urgently to teach our kids how dangerous things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are. People who live their life with Bluetooth in their ears, I tell you, you know, even our flame in mind, I will admit, we use Bluetooth for a few minutes, but then we shut it off. That Bluetooth is a very sharp square wave, which is profoundly disturbing to aura and bliss. Absolutely. And we feel, feel rolling waves of nausea the moment Wi-Fi is turned on in this house. <laughs> we put it outside and we rewire everything to use Ethernet. It's necessary. It's critical. It's survival related. And do not let your kids go to school with Wi-Fi. It's it's horrible. It will not just affect lucid dreaming uh, it, or, you know, the, lo the local caves down the hill here. There were people coming out of those caves with bliss. And then the day they installed Wi-Fi in those caves, absolute nausea. I'll give you another example. We were teaching in Geneva. And one day we had guest teachers. So we had four or five teachers in the front of the classroom and everybody had their laptop plugged in so now you got five computer transformers in the front of the classroom and we had witnesses every lady in in the whole front row that whole group lost ability to digest anything so five computer transformers in the front of the room and everybody's getting nausea and nobody can digest anything in the front rows what's the physics here you got to go around your house and diligently un start unplugging every single damn, and I do mean damn, transformer that you ain't desperately needing just at that moment. Switch the damn things off. Unplug them. Uh, the garage door opener down there, we found it was radiating RF, and we, we, we felt nausea until we unplugged the damn thing. Uh, electrosmog is hugely, hugely insidious. And if you're in doubt about that, Whatever problem you got in your life, you know, health problem, mental problem, whatever it is, try living in a cabin in the woods for about three to seven days and then compare. You go cold turkey and get rid of all that damn electrosmog for a few days and then decide, do you want to go back? It's horrible. 
So you diligently go around your house and you start removing, unplugging. Things are on a timer. You can rearrange a lot of things in your life to reduce the electrosmog. You know, we found that the washer and dryer here, the polarity of the plug was such that the whole metal surface of that water was radiating, in that case, 50 cycle, and was putting nausea in that whole half the house. We put the thing on a timer and a switch. So whenever you're not using it, you know, a double pole switch turns the damn thing off. And the electric heaters are the same thing. They didn't ground them correctly. It's called electrostatic electrosmog. So there's a huge, huge subject area here of electrosmog, which is hugely insidious to the opportunity to have, a, have bliss. It is a serious issue. So I recommend a serious study of the geopathic issues in your own home to learn to locate and diagnose the electrosmog because it's messy and it's huge and it's horrible. Whether it's your smart meter, we spent 500 bucks on the filter for our smart meter and Valerie says it still ain't good enough, but and, and we got all the Wi-Fi and all the Bluetooth off and we're unplugging the transformers and electrosmog every room and we got an expert in to diagnose which heater had the polarity, the power. You know, it's it's this is non-trivial. It is complicated and it is serious. So I'm telling you, if you want to access a big aura, you need to spend some time on getting reduced electrosmog in your house. That's just one example. Or just, I'm going to stop now, but when I got to Italy, I'd been going there for like 10 years to Reno. It turns out that the Italians were sneaking in the radio frequency towers in the kids' schools. So now suddenly all the kids' schools... And all the churches have microwave transmitters in the tower and they didn't tell anybody. And you go into these Italian little villages and you think it should be blissful and you feel nausea everywhere. It's hell, man. I tell you, this is, this is tricky. So until our governments know what a soul is, they cannot give you meaningful advice about getting that damn electrosmog out of your life. So you got to do it yourself until your government gets taught what it is the electrical engineering to have a soul. Then your government finally can make intelligent decisions about how the electrosmog is killing your kids. Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Dan, uh, would you like to mention about the Life Force app measuring the presence of Schumann harmonics in the space? Yeah. Thank you. You know, so it, it, uh, Tufan is usefully referring to our life force measure, which has evolved beautifully, flameandmind.com slash life force. <laughs> and you know, when we first were trying to measure whether a to tomato was alive or dead, we did. <laughs> you know, the first thing we had to do? Go down in the basement of the whole building and turn the master circuit breaker off for the whole building. And then... We could measure whether a tomato was alive or dead. <laughs> now, is that commercially valuable? Well, it's going to be tricky in your supermarket, I'll tell you. <laughs> but no, the thing is that the tomato, or in this case, it was a chicken egg. You can see all this at uh, flameandmind.com slash life force and goldenmean.info slash measuring life force. We spent, we spent 20 years on this. So the, the egg, we, in this case, where I'm talking about measuring an egg to see if it's alive or dead. And that egg will weakly organize its capacitive field. You'll see the Schumann harmonics, for example, if it's a live egg. And that will be about one microvolt. And if you're capable of spectrum analyzing that one microvolt for the Schumann infrasound, low frequency cascade, you will find out if that egg is alive or dead. And it's beautiful and it's powerful. And it's going to take a little while before our supermarkets figure this out. The point being that the life or death, the electric field, which is the life, the one microvolt, life or death electric field of that egg weakly organizing its capacitive field is about a thousand times weaker than the 50 cycle electrosmog in that room. Oops. <laughs> so how are you going to measure that? Oh. <laughs> so the, what we call life is a thousand, the, the electric field that we call life its capacitance is a thousand times weaker than the electrosmog in the average room. This is a problem. <laughs> On the other hand, if you go outside and there's no wind, you can quickly tell which tree is alive or dead because you can measure which one's getting the Schumann or not. As I tell the famous story, 
One tree in the Dutch forest was dying. We found a big metal fence and the frequency that was killing that tree was made by the fence and we measured it and we diagnosed and we fixed it. So if you go outside the building full of electrosmog, then our life force measuring device will tell you all kinds of wonderful, cool stuff, including which building will cause a seed to germinate. And that is the, me the measurement series that Juan Schlosser bioarchitects.net in Bali pioneered. He proved, we proved we can predict which building will cause a seed to grow and therefore a child by measuring the low frequency weak capacitance in the center of that building. But admittedly, in most cases, the main circuit breaker had to be off before you started the measurements because <laughs> the electrosmog is much more powerful than the Schumann harmonics. It doesn't mean that the earth is weak. It just means that our bodies have been programmed to entrain and embed a very weak capacitive field, which is DNA radio. I'll give you a very practical example. Bob Beck, who's the guy who discovered garlic disconnects your right hemisphere from your left hemisphere. <laughs> That's another story. But Bob Beck was a friend in psychotronics and he was famous. So he came into the psychotronics presentation and he took his Bic pen, rubbed it in his hair so it accreted a little bit of static. And then he did this. And he rattled that Bic pen at about eight Hertz and a wave of euphoria went through the room. Low power, eight Hertz, man, everyone felt a little rush of bliss. It was like a baby just found its milk. <laughs> However, if you, and so if you, now, so we did a lot of experiments on this. So if you put a sheet of aluminum foil in the ceiling and the floor and you feed about, actually the correct would be 7.29 to 7.83 Hertz actually. And you put one microvolt or maybe five or 10 microvolts to those two sheets of aluminum in the room and the whole room is entrained, the Schumann harmonics, and most everyone in the room will get a short rush of euphoria until they find out that the pacifier is not connected to the milk because the milk is the actual earth resonance. So if the synthetic source of the Schumann ain't really the earth Schumann, <laughs> your body eventually figures that out. Anywho, the point is that if you turn the, the voltage level up to the synthetic 8 hertz source to those aluminum foil plates, ceiling and floor, and make a very strong 8 hertz signal in the room, nobody gets any bliss. Ooh. The body was programmed to know that DNA radio is low power, not high power. <laughs> so perfect Schumann cascade at high power, <laughs> no, actually, because your biology knows what it needs to entrain to. It's So the power density of the bliss harmonics has everything to do with whether you pick up the mother's milk of the Earth's DNA radio. And by the way, the Schumann harmonics, perfect phase conjugate to Planck, exactly the same as the alpha beta brainwave harmonics for bliss, flameandmind.com. There's a reason that phase conjugate infrasound cascade is identical for brainwave bliss and Schumann harmonics. That's pure DNA radio implosion physics. Anyway, that is very much part of the conversation about environment for bliss. It, it tells you that buildings need to be assembled in such a way they can resonate to a very weak power source. It, it, the original design, Hermes, though, pyramids, the pyramid was called a Hummer and the pyramid height to diameter with base being golden ratio would then implode the low frequency power of the Schumann cascade. It was called the Hummer and it's called a phase conjugate pump wave. And that would drive a longitudinal into the earth grid at the longitudinal node called effective global wireless power. And that's how the pyramids did it. And that's why they were called the Hummer. So they were an imploder for the Schumann harmonic phase conjugate pump wave driver. So these are all examples of learning the science of what environment enables you to embed in that longitudinal array called DNA radio, collective unconscious communion of saints. We have many names for that array, but very pe few people actually understand the physics. Another practical example, in this living room, I'm sitting in here right now, you can feel the magnetic line on the other side of the house right there. That's where we put our zapped quartz charged 
quartz sand charged jars right on the other side of that wall. And the magnetic line, best one through this house, goes right out that wall to the Kanagu, the sacred Cathar mountain. So we are very familiar with the magnetic rivers through this house and how to use them to recharge, actually. So this is sort of life force 101 basics how to find your place of power in a room, how to make a magnetic map of your bed. You know, when Gary Skillen famously, first he started, he would heal the one stall in every barn where every cow that went there got sick. And then he learned to use charged quartz sand, bounce the geopathic around and heal the geopathic in the barn. Later, he did the same thing with people. He'd go in the house, say, don't tell me who's sick in this house. He would make a magnetic map of everybody's bed, and then he would tell you who was sick. Was that a happily ever after? Yep. yep. <laughs> um, we have a couple of questions go ahead, about go ahead. biologic architecture. So Olga asks, how about organite and shungite neutralize EVP pollution, or is the only way to unplug? Or is, what was the last phrase? or is the only way to unplug? Ah, um, well, uh, organite in general is a something like aluminum shreds inside a resin. The resin is a relatively high dielectric, and the aluminum shreds will generate a fairly significant capacitance. However, uh, they, they call, call them organite bombs. Uh, these can be useful for breaking up a geopathic. They can, rather temporarily. Unfortunately, they are useless for assembling any kind of symmetry. No, you will never, ever, ever make any kind of sacred space using organite with you know, the metal shreds inside. No, they will fractionate a messed up charge field, but to assemble a coherent rose-like charge field, no, this organite is useless. So you can break up some crap, but basically you're never going to assemble anything with that. So, you know, you can stick one over your transformer. It'll break it up temporarily, but that's, <laughs> you didn't really accomplish a whole lot. Anything that's implosive or centripetal could be helpful. Uh, and remember that longitudinal waves will pass through even a Faraday cage. So there's many issues to understanding longitudinal interferometry. Next question. An architect question from Ajda. Would, would concrete be dielectric material? What about if it's insulated by polymer plastic and armature is small scale carbon nets? You know, after the um, Goetheanum, the wooden one, which was gorgeous of Steiner, after it burned, he made the next one with concrete. And he was right. Concrete with the uh, calcium uh, is a relatively high dielectric and useful as a lens for capacitance. However, that damn steel uh, armature, the rebar, is fatal. I mean, it is fatal. So you, you know why your feet get tired when you walk on concrete? It's not because the concrete is keeping you from the Schumann. No, it's because of the metal rebar in the damn concrete that's bleeding your charge. That's why you can't stand walking on concrete. It's because the rebar in there is robbing you. Hello. So uh, another fun story, educational with regard to this question. Our friends in Torino, Kudai and Claudio, fabulous healing center in Torino. And we spent years planning, designing. So the local authority said, okay, you want carbon fiber, plastic, hemp, uh, bamboo, a rebar in your concrete. And they studied it. They said, okay, we'll let you do that in the upper floors, but we think the basement has to be steel rebar. So after fighting over this, for, I don't know, a year, whatever, the building was built. It's fabulous. We had lots of bliss in the top stories. But even to this day, you go in that building, you walk in the basement and you think your aura got sucked out of you, man. It ain't good. You go in the upstairs and your aura is breathing wonderfully. So that's an example. That steel rebar is a serious death threat to your aura, for sure. And it's true that most buildings today are a steel armature, and that's why it's fatal, including that idiot in Russia who's building pyramids with steel rebar in the concrete. It's fatal, man. <laughs> and including people who build stupas and temples with steel rebar. This is idiocy 101. 
So increasingly, however, carbon fiber, bamboo and uh, hemp and even plastic rebar. See, plastic, you know, the dielectric isn't wonderful, but it ain't fatal either. Plastic is rather relatively neutral to this. So any of those other rebars and you can still have some fun. But if your rebar is steel or aluminum, it is going to wipe out the aura. Seriously. You know, you'll never see as a uh, remote viewer from inside, inside a steel box. It's never going to happen. Next one from Summer. What about the copper fabric that claims to block RFID, RF, and reduce EMF and EMI? I have always been confused about those or copper is a conductor. Any opinions? Well, even when Ananda was teaching that a little bit of copper in paint could help reduce the electrosmog penetrating a building, for example, I think there is some truth to that. Although I think it would reduce a relatively low percentage. Uh, but it's true that a cage made of copper will reduce to some extent. And a copper... Uh, is less damaging than steel or aluminum, but it still ain't wonderful. Uh, so you can create some shielding with copper. For example, they have, you know, you have this pile of transformers in the corner of your house and you you order from a company that sells electrosmog electro -smog shields. They call electrosmog blankets sometimes. And a lot of those will be a copper mesh. And that will reduce some extent, both inductively and capacitively, a certain bandwidth of that electrosmog, but I wouldn't depend on it for the whole job. Uh, it's a, it's a weak and pathetic solution. The real solution is you need to eliminate the sources of the electrosmog. My friend in Singapore actually had relays around the house that as soon as the power need dropped in any of the house circuit, the relay just shut off the circuit by a dipole right at the source. Very interesting. So there's lots of ways to reduce electrosmog and a copper, copper shield is, is a beginning, but it isn't. It isn't the end of the job. Thank you. <laughs> well, was there more questions here? Um, there are more questions, but would you like to uh, finish the subject before? Or well, okay. So it is nine twenty. We usually go for just over ninety minutes or whatever. Have I completed the theme of our evening's conversation? Um, let's just say this. So we dealt a little bit about diet, about kinesthetic about the movement about the environment and about the psychology of bliss thinking shareable thoughts and we only touched briefly obviously very superficially there's more in the book conscious kids uh, but i think we've revealed enough about the pure principle behind what is bliss hygiene bliss hygiene is the ability to get the electric field around your body to be centripetal enough to support the implosion, braiding DNA, imploding heart harmonics, imploding brainwave harmonics, that that centripetal force eventually starts allowing your aura to radiate coherently. They say go into the next dimension, that's a golden ratio, it will show up in the number of harmonics in that field called harmonic inclusiveness goldenmean.info slash holarchy, which simply is another way of saying medically the fastest way to find out the health of your immune system is to measure the harmonic inclusiveness in your heart, actually HRV, heart rate variability. The reason harmonic inclusiveness measures health in general quickly, ithrive.com, I-T-H-R-V-E.com, is because harmonic inclusiveness means have you invited the maximum number of harmonics into your aura? Literally the physics of compassion, literally the physics of immune health. The healthy heart is a fractal heart, fractal in the sense that when the maximum number of harmonics can be contained in one oscillator called fractality, that defines immune health because it defines compression success. So if your heart rate has settled into one frequency only and you measure that, it means you're about to die. If your heart rate is very harmonic inclusiveness, usually a young person, <laughs> that means you've got a lot of immune health left. So it means literally to be healthy, you will need radical heart rate variability every day. 
And we simply do that every day. We say, oh, it's my heart rate variability time. And you go out and do anything, anything that gets your heart rate really high at least once a day or functionally your toast, actually, because your heart rate variability is going to narrow and eventually your immune system is going to collapse. So heart rate variability is urgent. And I would say one more comment about that since I worked with Irving Dardick making waves for years, where well, I knew him anyway, you know, he medically documented when the Olympic athletes used to go out and they would exercise high heart rate and then they would stop. So the graph of their heart rate looked like a square. And every single time that athlete would get a heart attack and die, literally. So, you know, if, if the athlete exercises in a way, very low heart rate, very high heart rate, and then stop, that's a square wave. That is a recipe for death. He measured it, heart attacks all over the place among the athletes, because it's the opposite of harmonic inclusiveness. Now, when he taught the heart, the athletes to do this, high heart rate, relax, slightly less high heart rate, relax, and then less high. So the graph of your heart rate over time looks like a caduceus. Does that sound familiar? Phase conjugation? Hermes? So if the graph of your heart rate during your exercise looks like a caduceus, this was an Olympic winner every time. That's called harmonic inclusiveness. So when you think about how you want the graph of your heart rate to look after your exercise, visualize a caduceus. So your heart rate gets really high, as high as you can. And then your next time is 0.618 is high. And so, and so you're scheduling your your workout in such a way that at the end of that time, it looks like a caduceus. And by the way, there's a breathing exercise that fits that perfectly. So this is an example of fractality, harmonic inclusiveness, and literally the implosion of charge in the exercise routine. So there's, and all of that, by the way, is at goldenmean.info slash holarchy, where we talk about this harmonic inclusiveness and immune health. So how, do we have the happily ever after? Well, at least you should have some clues about the generalized principle of what allows your aura to get dense and implode. And soon you should find yourself increasingly able to lose a dream, which indicates, you know, the soul is evolving and you will take something at death. And that's a serious, seriously useful physics. Okay. Okay, maybe Whatever, let's do, do a few for fun. All right. All right. Yeah. Janet asks, is the solution for rebar within the concrete to create electrical offer ground, grounding the entire embedded rebar into the earth through rods connected to it and embedded into the earth, therefore grounding the entire slab on great concrete foundation areas, similar to the electrical panel ground rods and continuation the, the ufer ground is an electrical earth grounding method developed during world war ii it uses a concrete and encased electrode to improve grounding in dry areas the question of grounding is profound and useful and the book earthing answers most many of those questions uh, it is true the quality of the ground has everything to do with usefulness and conventionally, the quality of ground is measured. You drive in the ground rod and you no measure the number of ohms of resistance between that ground and a perfect ground, quote unquote, perfect ground. And that measurement of the ohms of resistance tells you whether you have a quality ground rod. And in dry areas, it's true. It's harder to get a good quality ground rod. All that being said, however, the steel in the armature in that rebar, even if it's grounded well, is going to prevent your aura from breathing through it. Absolutely. So improving the grounding is a very, very limited solution to the problem of capacitance in buildings. Essentially, it means the reason your building wants dialect, I mean, high biologic material, which is high dielectric material, which means more fractal molecularly, is because that high dielectric means capacitance can breathe efficiently which means your aura can breathe efficiently. Grandma could go through the roof because <laughs> in her lucid dream, because the building is made of biologic materials. If grandma's in a steel building cage, she won't die well. Hello. And ground rods are not going to fix that problem. Sorry, it ain't going to happen. A you know, grounding does help. But see, the thing is, 
It's the people that need the grounding and they need the grounding directly to the earth in order to gain the context richness. So about 90% of health problems probably do go away if you can walk barefoot enough on, nat on nature. And that's what the book Earthing explains very well. And grounding the rebar in your building is going to help slightly, but it's not going to solve the problem of your aura being able to get the DNA radio living in the Schumer harmonics because that ain't going to make it into that building. Um, Theo asks, it seems to me like that have visited Damanhur community in Italy. My question is, was there a temple made with metal bars as well? It seems to me from the pictures I saw there. Yeah, I, I hate to say something unpopular, but Damon Hur has their problems. <laughs> they called it selfic circus, which is old psychotronics. And I mean old psychotronics. They're doing something wonderful today at Damon Hur. They're, they're, they're experimenting with tree communication and spectrum analysis of trees and tree music. And that's wonderful. But their underground temple was a nightmare for, for, for metal and terrible place for bliss. I mean, they didn't get it right at all. Excuse me. It's a metal nasty mess. And our friends, I have to say this very gently, but our friends, real experts here in um, in South France who went to Diamond Herd saw all kinds of I, I just, astral hygiene messes everywhere. And I'm sorry, Diamond Herd. They're trying, but the science, no. As close as they can come to science, they're trying. You know, I think they're very noble. And there's some very sweet people. But deep understanding of the actual geophysics and geobiology, oh, well, I think they'll get there. But no, the, the underground temple at Diamond Hur is full of metal, and it ain't pretty. That's my humble opinion. Um, can you please elaborate on the comment about Bob Beck and garlic? <laughs> when we were flying through Santiago three times one year, <laughs> and, and Valerie diligently interviewed the airline pilot about... Did you know that if you ate garlic, your response time is so bad that you shouldn't be a pilot? <laughs> She's right. It's called sattvic food. And so they won't let you eat garlic. Well, what Bob Beck actually measured, and I, well, I knew him fairly well, but I wasn't there when he made the measurement. But he was doing brainwave studies. And he discovered that every time his subjects came back from Italian lunch, suddenly there was no connection between their right and left hemisphere brain waves. And he replicated that study. So it's very clear, uh, a significant amount of garlic will measurably electrically disconnect your right from your left hemisphere. That's absolutely measured, well-documented, well-proved. It's incontroversible. I'm sorry to the Italians if they don't like this, but it's physics. <laughs> now, the, the reason the garlic disconnects the right and left hemisphere probably has to do with that little poison green thing in the center and other things. But the chemistry is clear. Uh, so yes, garlic may be helpful for many diseases. However, there's a serious problem in that it disconnects your brain waves, and that's been measured. And, and Bob Beck published on this, and it's, it's in the literature. And it fits the Indian tradition of sadhwik food. Actually, they won't eat both onion and garlic. Now, the onion question is more complicated and more subtle, perhaps. But yes, garlic is a serious problem for brainwave coherence. It's well-known and well-measured, and, and we avoid it carefully. And I recommend you do as well. Dustin asks, so terrified frequencies are not serving an entrainment type of effect as Schumann, but the wave dynamics are creating a type of organizing effect which influences the resonance with the body? Well, the Therify infrasound is the idealized Schumann and brainwave harmonics. That's what it is. That perfected Schumann and perfected brainwave cascade is exactly what the Therify infrasound modulating the megahertz subcarrier and the optical that the modulation is schumann and that is beautifully in training now i'm not saying you know uh, people need it but i'm saying it can be a tool on the way to bliss and in fact there are some tests i bought paul uh tried this and we believe that about 30 percent particularly of young women who have therify experience particularly if they're lying down will have some form of bliss euphoria and we know exactly the physics, you know, DNA radio gets hooked to the Schumann. That's what it is. The same way that same exact wave shape, which we claim is the world's most powerful bliss binaural induction, audio induction frequency, 
fed in the headphones called Flame and Sound at flameandmind.com. The world's most powerful bliss inducing bliss binaural audio is exactly what we're driving the Therify with precisely. And we're driving five, at least five different devices right now with it. Therify, Quantify, PlasmaFire.com, FiveVibes.com, and there's two more coming soon. And are they fun? PSOFire.com. Check it out. Oh, my God. We're going to have more fun with that. But it's all perfect implosion sound. And so that implosive infrasound, which is what drives the pyramids as well, by the way, uh, is, is, is psychokinetically powerful. It's pure implosion. Sound, and it's pure entrainment. And if you relax into it, it can serve you beautifully. It, I'm not saying you need it. I'm not saying you need any gadget, but I'm saying it's a tool that can be used well. Okay, next one from Ajda. The explosive capacitance must be, in our case, the tingling feeling in the different parts of our bodies during the reconnective healing. But why was that measured that more people facilitating or one person limits the effectiveness of the reconnective healing frequencies while one-on-one -on -one is the best? I'm not sure I understood the question well, but let me give an example that might be relevant. When we uh, were in that room where we we're measuring live blood cell results from Therify Implosive Plasma, and we have about 70 to 80% of people had a dramatic deroulet, declumping de effect in their live blood cell trials after Therify. And that's all the live blood cell pictures at therify.net. We interviewed those who did not get the deroulet, the declumping in their blood cells. And the ones who did not have the dramatic effect were ones who said they did not achieve deep relaxation, actually. And then we asked more questions and we found out that the ones where there were other people in the room dramatically reduced their ability to relax, actually. Mm -hmm. And so there, if I were good, if there's lovers and there's been Tantra, but if there are people that don't know each other well, for example, could not lucid dream together, <laughs> then actually the bliss experience is not as effective. So it's true in that sense that one-on-one -on -one was better, actually. I'm not sure I addressed the question, but I think so. Thank you. Um, so human frequency plus frequencies only in harmony creates the bliss, creates the life force, creates non-destructive wave collapse compression. Got it. Thank you, Dan. Dustin adds to the previous question. Okay. Um, it's all about charge collapse. Exactly. Um, Summer asks, what's your opinion upon aura for those who have such an overpowered mind naturally? where they are non-stop thinking unless they use marijuana. Example being, one has an overactive mind and the effects of marijuana quite and calms the mind and nerves. Would it still then cause holes within the aura or could it possibly help those gain the calmness to heal those holes? Yeah, maybe that's a bit of a complicated question. And I'm not claiming to be the expert on this, but intuitively, while it has been replicably measured that frequent marijuana use, particularly among young people, dramatically reduces attention span, that we can say with certainty from research. So we know that uh, frequent marijuana use, particularly among you, young people, they will lose attention span. That is predictable. That's measurable. Now, when you're saying if someone has an overactive mind, uh, will the marijuana smooth it out? Well, the marijuana enables the person to um, achieve a short-term euphoria. That's true. Uh, does it enable them to achieve a long-term attention balance? No, absolutely not. Uh, whether or not the marijuana is the radical cause of holes in the aura, I think we should look at more measurements on that one. I know Karatkov measured, you know, a, a drug addiction definitely puts holes in the aura, but whether marijuana is one of the worst causes of holes in the aura or not, I don't know. But I would hypothesize, however, that in the long term, a, a porous aura would result from long-term marijuana use in most cases. It's particularly dangerous, obviously, for young people. And whether marijuana helps someone whose mind is too active I would suggest that most any 
form of yoga meditation therapy, which is specifically designed to get the active mind to focus on center, on pure principle, which ultimately is stillness. This is when the active mind becomes implosive and literally the relaxation links it with the heart and creates a centering force. And marijuana is absolutely no substitute for that in my view. Now, I'm not saying that you know, medical marijuana for all kinds of pain issues isn't useful. And there's all kinds of young people who have serious health problems who've been helped by medical marijuana. We have to recognize that's real. But at the same time, the extensive literature proving that young people using mar marijuana too much lose attention span, that is dramatic and serious. Thank you. Um, what are the top up to five exercises, rituals, mantras, and or meditational techniques that promote Maximum harmonic inclusiveness. What what uh, what what are the exercises that? What are the top exercises? Oh, let's say. Nah. Well, I would look at the sequence of breath exercises. For example, you start with a caduceus breathing, and then you start with a mayor wave, five second and ten second breath. The Mayer wave is the most important resonance frequency of the blood and the HRV LF component, the most important what heart math, the only thing heart math calls heart coherence. So the, the breath exercises are a great place to start with there. A caduceus fire breath, followed by a, a 10 second Mayer wave breath. These are excellent ways. Even the therapy people say a, a 10 second, 10 second, five second in, five second out. Uh, Mayer wave breath is a beautiful way to start most trance sections, sessions, therapy sessions, bliss, that's a beautiful, beautiful. So breathing techniques would be a good start. And then the other would really try the dartic, you know, plan your exercise so that your heart rate goes up and down like a caduceus instead of like a square. <laughs> that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Heart rate variability is essentially your heart feels safe enough to relax. In general, that's going to mean that it's going to be much more variable and fractal in your heart harmonics if you're able to exercise in nature and not in the big city, or at least in the middle of the city. That it's very similar. It's a uh, jazz machine teaching people to live without food. Step one is spend a big chunk of your day in nature. Why? Because you can implode there. It's very simple. So, you know, heart rate variability exercise has everything to do with environment as well and if you have the privilege of exercises in exercising in sacred space that's primo last question from hair creed harry do you know about seven day dark room experiment to activate dmt yeah our uh, our italian group spent time with um uh, who wrote the book on Tantra in uh, Bali? It was, uh, oh, it, so there, the, the schools teaching darkroom meditation uh, did a lot of work on this and they did good work. So it is true uh, that somewhere around three to six days in a totally dark environment uh, will produce a melatonin rush at the end. It's true. And that melatonin rush will be at least a temporary form of clairvoyance in many, many cases. And that's true. Now, uh, you know, it was the elder brother story, the Kogi that first talked about, the, you know, they have these young people, they raise them for years in caves with no light. And it's true. These, these, many of them became clairvoyant, actually. Now, I have friends from Berlin, actually, who, you know, did these exercises. And, and eventually, these people were, were deathly afraid of any light getting in the building because they were busy building their bliss. Well, this took it a little bit far. The fact is that you don't need long-term darkroom experience to develop some clairvoyance, but it is, a it is a legitimate way to get some melatonin rush and thus clairvoyance. Clairvoyance, remember, is longitudinal coherence prehension. That's what it is. And to get there, well, yes, the melatonin rush at the end of you know, a week-long darkroom experience, it, it's a way to get there. Whether it's the best way, I don't think so. Whether it's useful for some people, I, it probably is. And, 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 and darkroom, you know, the mamas of the Kogi who did that uh, are 
incredibly profound. However, I don't think that kind of activity is balanced or appropriate in most modern settings. And I don't think teaching people to spend a lot of time in a dark room is the best use of their time just to have a little bit of bliss rush. But for one taste of clairvoyance, in some cases, it's very useful. Thank you for answering all the questions and giving us your beautiful insight. Then. Well, whether that was happily ever after, I'm not sure. But hopefully we have some more clues this evening on specifically what is the science behind a generalized hygiene for bliss, the quality of grace, Remember, this trans we're, we're, this transcends all spiritual traditions. We're not all the spiritual traditions were all beautiful, and what links them is science. And when we can see the science behind all the spiritual traditions, then we have a shot at oneness, plus the end of religion wars. So that's one of the many reasons why it's useful to understand the science behind bliss hygiene. So thank you very much. I'm Dan Winter, fractalu.com. And we thank Tufan Guven, geometricmodels.org, and uh, Shelly from thesharablewave.com, and all the wonderful friends who joined us this evening. And then would you like to announce next week's topic? Uh, I forgot what next week's topic is. No, no next, next week's topic week was the tour of uh, memory, is down memory lane. Let me look. Uh, yes, here it is. I have it. So next week's topic is... Uh, serious physics of our Star Trek future. So I'm going to be dealing again with warp, impulse, stargates, portals, and dimensions, really talking about the technology of a stargate future and how understanding that can empower our technologies together. And that would include uh, warp, impulse drive, and zero-point energy devices, and med beds, and the physics behind them. That's next week, April 9th. Okay, thank you. That was the happily ever after. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Dan. Bye, yeah, everyone. Bye. Bye. Blessings. Thank you. Bye, good night. Thank Bye, you. Blessings. Bye, everybody. Bye, Melissa. Thanks all for coming. We had some fun. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.